My healthy habits. Surprise is the only We're emotion an that requires an interpretation. Oh, wherever we go. But the real choice we, go we can change is what life can do. Thank you. The way we do college in the United States is broken. I'm here as one step on my journey to try and help make it better. For 15 years, I was a professor. And towards the end of that time, I was experiencing a lot of heartbreak and frustration, trying to make the college experience a bit better for students. And I quit. Obviously, I didn't quit altogether, or I wouldn't be here right now. But I quit trying to make change from inside the system. And I quit my job. And it took me a long time to try to figure out how I could use all of the experience that I'd built up in the higher education system to try to do something that might be a bit helpful and maybe even effective. And I settled on the choice to start my own college. Wait, I know what you're thinking. That is not a normal life choice. <laughs> I imagine I am probably the only person in this entire room who thought to herself, oh, hey, that sounds like fun. Let's give that a try. But I think we're on to something. We're still young, so we're still at the beginning of this stage, but we're definitely doing higher education frontwards, which I'll come back to. And we are putting students first. And we've created what I think is an actual, real alternative model to the traditional model that we've all become really accustomed to. Here's what I was seeing every single day as a professor that ended up sort of nudging me down this path. In the United States, we tell young people that when they graduate from high school, they should go to college. Pretty much regardless of their background, their family history, their access to resources, their interests, we give them all the exact same advice, go to college. And most young people follow that advice. They go to college, and they get there, and they get an advisor who they're given maybe 10 or 15 minutes a year to talk to. And that person's primary job is to check things off of a list, to make sure that that student is following along on a preset timeline and filling all of these prescribed requirements. And sometime early on in that relationship, that advisor asks the student, hey, take a look at this long list of things and pick one of those things to be your major, to be your area of focus, so that they know which checklist that they're supposed to be applying to this particular student. Fast forward some number of years, and towards the end of this experience, somebody, usually it's a family member or a friend, somebody who cares a lot about that student, asks a question like, so what's your plan for life? It's a good question, and the student is probably really, really grateful to be asked it. <laughs> right? But much like you're thinking, that student's probably thinking, wait a minute, shouldn't somebody have asked me that, like, you know, before? Like, maybe even at the very beginning of this process, so that I could have had that in mind as I made all these other decisions. Because the way our system works, you don't actually get to try out that thing that you picked until after you graduate. Maybe, if you're lucky, right before. And by then, it often feels too late. Like, it's too late to change your mind. You've invested a lot of time and energy and money into that. And you kind of maybe feel stuck with the choice that you made. And at some point in this experience, that student has realized that this entire education system, it just seems designed to sort them. First, it's sorting them by their standardized test scores, into which colleges they can apply to. And then, once they get there, it sorts them by their GPA, sometimes into which major that they can consider, but definitely into, by the time they graduate, what jobs they can apply for, or what next steps they have available as options to them. And they know that they're so much more than that. They're more than those test scores, and they're more than their GPA, more than their resume, more than their transcript. But they're never asked to show up as these whole, complex, full human beings. And it seemed to me that there had to be a better way. So I did the things that people do. 
I read books and I read articles, <laughs> watched films. And they were really good because it really helped me understand a lot of the criticisms of the way we do higher education in this country. And those resources were really phenomenal at analyzing how things came to be this way. But what I couldn't hardly ever find was an actual alternative, like a different model, a vision for how we could be doing this differently than we're already doing it. Some of the things that I learned really surprised me. Frankly, some of them made me feel a little bit silly or stupid, that I didn't know these things already. I'd been in the higher education system for a long time, first as a student and then as a faculty member, and I felt like I should have known some of this stuff. A few examples. Most young people do follow the advice that they're given, and after high school they go to college. But only a little over half of people who start college finish. And if you look at people who go to a two-year college, it's worse. It's only a little over a third. And of the people who do finish, the ones who graduate, 70% of them have debt. That averages between $28,000 and $40,000, depending on how you slice that data. But the people that I talk to, and the many of the people that you know, they say they have about twice that much. And the one that surprised me the very most, the one that I thought to myself, wow, how did I not know this? Is that only 33% of Americans have a college degree. Most of us don't. But that is not the impression that we give young people when they're trying to make the decision of what to do after high school. And as a result, we have a lot of folks who go to college, get in a lot of debt, and they don't finish, and they don't have a degree, and they have feelings of shame and failure that they carry around with them. We can do better. I brought with me a story to try to illustrate how it worked out in my imagination that maybe we could do this better. This is TJ. TJ is 21 years old, he's from North Carolina, identifies as gender non-binary and as a first-generation college student. TJ did what most of us do when we graduate from high school, and they went to a college. In their case, they chose a large state university close to where they grew up. When they got there, they picked a major that as closely as possible matched their interests. A year and a half later, TJ dropped out and went back home to their parents' house. Now, TJ's parents happened to have heard about the college that I started. It's called Wayfinding Academy. And TJ did some research, sent us an email. I got on the phone with TJ right after that, and we had a really nice conversation about what was frustrating to them about their first college experience, um, what they thought they wanted to do next in their life. Obviously, we also talked about what they thought about moving across the country to Portland, Oregon. And TJ decided to apply. In our application process, we do not ask for SAT scores or ACT scores or GPAs. We ask a series of questions that gets the person to try to reflect on how they came to be where they are right now in their life and what they want for themselves in the next stage of life. One of the questions we asked TJ was to tell us a time when they learned something new that changed their worldview. And TJ told us about a film that they watched. And they wrote, uh, I've been vegan for almost two years because of that film. And that film made me realize the importance of having a discussion about how animal agriculture impacts climate change and how veganism could potentially be part of that solution, but also acknowledge that it's a privilege to be able to choose to be vegan. Our team read through all of TJ's application and obviously thought, this person's amazing. And we thought, we can probably help. We can probably help TJ figure out what to do with all of their interests and form a life path with that. But it's not really up to us at all. So we invited TJ to come visit us so that they could meet more of our faculty, staff, current students, 
so they could make an informed and intentional choice about whether this was a good next step for them. Then we sent a member of our team to North Carolina to show up in person by surprise with the help of TJ's dad to invite TJ to be a student with us. A few months later, TJ moved to Portland. They're more than halfway through the two-year program with us. They'll be graduating in July in our second class of graduates. And right now, TJ has a guide who they meet with every week, whose job is not to check things off of a list, but whose job is to help TJ figure out how to integrate their interests into all of the different elements of the wayfinding curriculum and make sure that they're ready for their next steps after graduation. Last year, in one of their core courses, TJ decided to make a public service announcement video that talked about the negative impact that social media can have on young people's formation of identity. And TJ's hosted multiple art shows on campus that feature their artwork, other students' artwork, and community members' art. For the first of their two internships, they chose to work with a small business that helps other small businesses implement environmentally sustainable practices. Last spring, TJ went with us to our annual trip to Spain to walk the Camino de Santiago pilgrimage. And just recently, TJ got back from a national conference with over 100 other college students to talk about how to be more effective change makers in our democracy. All of that is in just a little over a year. And all of that is in TJ's online portfolio, so that when they graduate, they have a collection of their experiences and a tool that they can use to show the world who they are and what they're capable of doing. I could have told many stories like that about our students. And we now have alumni who used their two years with us and the experiences they had and the connections that they made to go directly into what they wanted to be doing after. Annie is a carpenter at one of the premier green building companies in town. Alden transferred to a four-year college to get a science degree to round out his desire to be an outdoor environmental educator. Haley started her own event planning company. Austin facilitates retreats for young men to break down patterns of toxic masculinity. And none of them have debt as a result of going to wayfinding. So I know we can be doing this better. And we can change the thing that we tell young people when they're trying to make the decision of what to do after high school. They could go to a four-year college. But if they do, they should be making an informed and intentional choice about where to go that's going to help them get to where they're trying to get to in life. Which means that somebody needs to be asking them that question. What do you want to do with your life? Instead of asking them, where are you going to college? And their answer to that question, what do you want to do with your life, might mean that they should do something other than go to a four-year college. Maybe they should directly get a job doing what they want to be doing. Maybe they should go to a trade school. Maybe they should take a gap year and travel. Maybe they should start their own business. But since many of our young people will continue to go to college, we owe it to them to do it better. The way we do college impacts all of us. It weaves its way through the way that we live our lives and through the way we see ourselves and the way we see each other. And in closing, I'd like to offer us a different way of seeing. How about there's more than one way to do life? One definition of success is not enough. Too often, the choice posed is what college to pick, but the real choice is what life to pick. We find the freedom to choose when we quiet the voices of others' expectations. Learning emerges from curiosity, and education should stoke it, not cure it. We're humans to be cultivated, not objects to be sorted. And the line between the real world and school, between life and work, it's imaginary. 
We each have distinct potential. Let's not waste it. And we all deserve the chance to grow without soul-crushing debt. Education is an investment that we should share because it's our chance to make the world better. What you choose to do with your life matters to more than just you. And when we each live life on purpose, we can all thrive. Thank you.